Arizona, we cancel public events because <laughs> people, uh, what's that called, uh, when the cars hit the grease on the road and they do that hydro flaming? That's what happens all over Arizona, I guess, because we have so many creosote bushes on the side of the road that we get extra grease on the road and everyone ends up in the ditch even with a quarter inch of rain. You should see us when it snows, that's really bad. So I'm grateful to see all of you. I'm going to make this largely into a conversation after some introductory remarks because I'd love to hear um, your stories in relation to the topic that we're discussing tonight. Just a little topic of uh, whether with accelerating climate change our food system is going to be radically restructured. Not that we're all going to go hungry, but how we think of food, how we get it, how we grow it, and interestingly enough, how we process it, I think, is going to radically change. Let me just footnote one of those comments. About uh, one-fifth of our carbon footprint, the amount of fossil fuels and, and other uh, energy that goes into the food that comes to our table, is what happens on the farm itself. So one-fifth is sort of the farmer as land steward and water steward's responsibility to directly deal with. There's also the, all the embedded energy that comes into uh, fossil fuels and, and fertilizers that happens with inputs coming to the farm. And then a lot of this, how much our eating impacts the world in a positive or negative way, is what happens from the time the food leaves the farm till the time we either eat it or it's put into the dumpster or the compost pit. So each of you votes with your pocketbook and your belly and your mouth and your garbage can for what kind of food system we have. And part of the book is about that. I first want to ask you uh, a very simple geographic question. How many of you be have been down south of Elephant Butte Reservoir and seen the Rio Grande between that infamous Truth or Consequences and El Paso over the last uh, three years? Quite a bit of you, over half of you. Um, uh, how deeply could you cast for uh, uh, your, <laughs> your uh, uh, hooks or flies for fish in the stretch of the, the Rio Grande that you saw? Um, was there water in it? Where, any answers? The bio lake was three feet deep all the way across. Three feet deep all the way across. The deepest place in the entire lake is 13 feet deep, right next to the spillway. Yeah, that's why we don't have, uh, I always say uh, to my, my kids when they were small, I, I told them that we don't have a Loch Ness monster in Arizona or New Mexico because our reservoirs are so, and lakes are so shallow that it would have to be a flatworm, you know. <laughs> Um, but, but I have to say, three years ago when I went to see my brother-in-law in Las Cruces, he has a very small pecan orchard, not one of those mega pecan orchards south of town near La Mesilla, but, but you know, 15 to 25 trees. And, and the river was dry within a half mile of his house. And he told me that this year they're allowed four acre inches of water <laughs> for irrigation out of the uh, irrigation ditches rather than three to four feet of water, about one-tenth to one-twelfth of what they normally get for irrigation is allowable this year. I was stunned, and to see the riverbank dry going through those pecan orchards, I think was a game changer for me. I realized that this, this isn't, uh, you know, like a like a Christmas song, Santa Claus is coming, climate change is coming. How it's impacting our food system is already here. And let me just go through some of the other indicators of that. Um, two years ago, or three summers ago, excuse me, we hit an all-time record of the number of counties in the U.S. declared drought disaster areas, 500 counties. And some people said, well, that was... Uh, President Obama trying to give relief out to rural counties, uh, which I just thought, yeah, that's, that's the easiest way to win votes, right? Uh, you have a farmer who's lost their crop, and so you... you... Anyway, 
that was a record setter, 500 counties. Last year, it was 2,100 counties declared drought disaster areas, four times more than ever in American history. Of course, we didn't have those designations like drought disaster areas earlier. But we also, over the last few years, have had more acreage burned in the watersheds above farms and ranches. Look up near Santa Clara and, and uh, what you have uh, up by Bandelier. Look what's happening in Yosemite right now. We have the largest seed shortage of native plant seed and of crop seed ever before in American history because of not only crop failure, but the incredible demand to revegetate areas that have been burned or in the east washed out by the floods from Hurricane Sandy. So the notion that we have uh, climatic catastrophes on a more frequent basis than before is clearly with us. And that's just one tiny part of the whole story of climate change. And I like to call it climate uncertainty rather than using terms like global warming because I think that's what farmers feel. That's what they know in their hearts, what they see on their land. Um, uh, two winters ago, uh, I've been putting in an orchard of about, uh, it's up to about 80 heirloom fruit tree and nut tree varieties. And we lost about a third of the more uh, Mediterranean ones like uh, uh, Mission Olives and Mission Figs because of catastrophic freezes in the winter. The same thing hit um, really from, from Tucson, Arizona, all the way into West Texas two winters ago and again last winter. So I lost uh, $3,500 worth of trees in a matter of six hours okay, with, with plummeting temperatures. The climate uncertainty, the variability, the sense that the seasons aren't quite right compared to what we have in our memories and our hearts and the smells of certain times of the year are all kind of off. And, and this is what farmers are telling me all the way across the country from Maine, where they got 98 degrees in April two years ago, to Alaska, where they're seeing ice melting, to um, uh, uh, farmers up in Idaho that were on the edge of that heat wave this summer that almost got Furnace Creek up to 136. It stopped at 130, 131. It would have set a new Guinness Book of World Records for a single peak. But it isn't the single peaks that are going to change our lives. It's this gradual change in climate variability with some rises and falls. But that, that the, um, the normal conditions aren't something that you're going to hear farmers speak of anymore. We don't know what that is anymore. So how do we deal with uncertainty? This is a psychological, spiritual, artistic, aesthetic, social question, not just a technical question. How do we learn to adapt to uncertainty? That seems like a paradox, a sort of riddle within a riddle. Well, we can't adapt to something that we don't know what it's going to be. Why are you even using the word adapted? Well, what a lot of this book is about, and I'm, I'm grateful to have worked with Chelsea Green Press um, on it because they took the risk that this notion mattered, is that there's a heck of a lot of people in the world that know how to adapt to climate uncertainty, water scarcity, occasional heat waves, because they've been doing it for hundreds, if not thousands of years, albeit not with some of the frequencies that, that we're seeing now. But over the last 30 years as an ethnobotanist and agroecologist, I've been able to travel on work projects, not as a tourist, to uh, the Gobi and Taklamakan deserts in China, where um, uh, uh, we and Uyghur people grow 50,000 acres of vegetables and grapes with runoff from the mountains, water harvesting systems that have been in place for 1,400 years that are still functioning. I've gotten to go to Oman, where my own distant kin are using uh, kanat or falak irrigation systems that gets the water off stone slopes, puts it into or horizontal tunnels below ground, 
and then delivers it in much the way that the acechia systems here do. In fact, the term acechia probably came from that area in Yemen and Oman among the al Hadr uh, Arab tribes. I got to go to places uh, in Morocco where people are using desert adapted crops that regularly flower in fruit in temperatures of above 110 to 115 degrees, something that we're regularly getting uh, in southern Arizona now. And they're doing remarkable things, both in terms of maintaining traditions and maintaining innovations that have been recently sprung from their own experience that I think we need to pay attention to more than ever before. Bluntly, what we think of our corpus of knowledge for farming today in the United States is not enough to get us through the next 50 years. We need to foster a level of innovation among farmers and ranchers like we've never had before and we need to listen and watch with other cultures, particularly desert cultures, but a variety of immigrant and indigenous cultures around the world, and how they've adapted to heat waves, drought, water scarcity, and other uh, uh, climatic uncertainty um, through many, many techniques that we've never allowed inside our borders. You know, it's against the law for me to harvest water in Arizona because Phoenix owns the water that falls on my farm. So I got turned down to do one of those Omani Falah uh, Ganat horizontal wells by the USDA because they said, without ever seeing my farm, you'll be illegally impounding water. In fact, the impoundment for the water was already there. I could have, I could have challenged their decision, but it just seemed, you know, what an oddity that we're, we're penalized for wanting to harvest rainwater to grow food here. <laughs> the same thing with gray water, the same thing with many other things. We had a wonderful woman stay with us last week who was born in China who's um, deciding that what we really need for street people in all of our cities because we're generating homeless people faster than we're generating food and other sustainable practices is street trees for street people. So she's top working trees like ornamental plums and things that you might see around town with 14, 15 different varieties of, of uh, low chill fruit that then within a, a, another year will start producing different varieties of fruit that then neighbors in that area can use to see which varieties are now adapted to their own microclimate. If you live up by uh, Canyon Road, you may have an entirely different uh, microclimate than what you have if you live down by the river. So there's a tremendous amount of experimentation happening both among traditional peoples and immigrant peoples who are new here in trying to see what will work in the future for a food system. And the irony is most Americans think of tradition and innovation as two separate issues. And I would say more than ever before, we need to listen to the 4,100 years of traditions that we have, say, with that antiquity of corn agriculture in the Southwest here, there's 4,100-year-old corn over by Zuni, up by Hopi, and down near where I live in Tucson. That shows that people have been farming here successfully with a fair amount of climate change happening over those last uh, 4,000 years. And, and we need to really listen and understand what our predecessors were doing. And just like Janine Benyus and other people are saying, we need to use the concept of biomimicry to redesign new sustainable systems of transportation, um, uh, waste uh, uh, management, agriculture, etc. We also need to look at eco-mimicry, how natural systems can serve as models for new forms of agriculture, like my buddy Wes Jackson does, and what I call ethno-mimicry, which is looking carefully at how uh, prehistoric peoples, like the Nabataeans in Israel and Jordan, or the Anasazi have farmed, and really not try to imitate that like we're going to be want to be Anasazi, but look at the principles that underlie how they fed themselves. 
And more than ever before, we have to have our ears and eyes and hearts open to adapting to the unforeseen conditions that are already beginning to hit us and hit our farming system. So um, this is the first kind of um, how-to book I've ever written. And I should say, I, you know, even when I've had other kind of practical things in, um, in um, my books like recipes, my family says, oh, no, no, don't, don't do that. You'll kill people the way you cook if they cook just like you do. I mean, you will end up with dead people in kitchens all over the southwest if they, if they do the, you know, vegan roadkill dish that you uh, had in your last book. Don't go there. Well, the same thing people said, well, don't redo your, your land like Gary does. You're going to end up with with something that looks like Dr. Chaos's eco-agricultural uh, uh, experiment site. Uh, so the farm we have, we call the, the Almunia, uh, a term for an experimental orchard that Steven Ariano taught me. Almunia de los sopilotes, what I don't kill the, or what I do kill the turkey vultures get, and then what survives, we, we add on to and augment. So I do a lot of experimentation the way I farm and garden and grow orchard crops and the way I cook. So there is practical knowledge in there, but I just want to say, don't do what I'm trying to do. Do what 4,100 years of farming in the Southwest can lead you to do. That there's a lot of innovation that's happened over those four millennia. And I believe more innovation happening right now in the Southwest among farmers and ranchers and orchard keepers than ever before. This is a really exciting time to be involved with groups like the Kavira Coalition or, or uh, Pam Roy's Farm to Table group because you get to hear so many farmers and ranchers doing extraordinary innovations in this climate, in this landscape. And so whether it's water harvesting or employing a larger set of uh, seed um, varieties or fruit trees, especially low-chill fruit trees, or shifting from herbaceous annual food crops to herbaceous perennial food crops. Chapter by chapter, this takes you through building soil moisture capacity, more efficient water delivery to the plant roots, uh, selecting uh, uh, plants for intercropping and polyculture, and then stacking those functions, as the permaculture guys say, so that you have multiple layers of of food plants buffering each other from freezes and heat waves and all of that. With that little introduction, I'm going to open this up to some questions and conversations because if I tell you everything in the book, whether you get it now or Tuesday, you won't need to buy it. So I'd rather uh, learn from you all and have this as a conversation rather than a talking head performance. So any any questions or comments right off? Yeah. yeah what is a long a low chill fruit tree. Okay, so one of the interesting things is that um, most fruit trees, but particularly apple and pear varieties, require a certain number of hours between 32 degrees and 45 degrees Fahrenheit during the winter to trigger buds flowering and fruiting in the spring and summer. If you're an apple tree from Russia or Germany, you may need 1,500 chill hours. If you're one from, say, the Mediterranean climates where a lot of the things that came into New Mexico and Arizona originally came from, you may need 750 hours, half that, because over centuries those adapted to, to this area. Over uh, the period from 1950, to the present, we've lost over 250 chill hours at most localities in the West, in some places as much as 500 chill hours. So 1,500 minus, you know, uh, 500, that's 1,000, but what if you started out with 1,000, you're down to 500 and, and not many uh, apples and pears that allow you to grow them now. So for them to produce good quality fruit and a lot of fruit rather than just sort of shutting down, you, you need to plant varieties out 20 years. How many chill hours are we going to have in 2030 if you're planting a tree today? 
So uh, Union of Concerned Scientists is, has said, well, in places like Pennsylvania, people are going to have to rip out about uh, over 50% of the varieties that they now have in the ground. Reports from Napa Valley with great vines and high summer temperatures say these grapes are going to have their optimum quality in Oregon, not in Napa Valley within 20 years, so you might as well rip out 80% of what's in Napa Valley now and put in varieties from Portugal, southern Spain, and Morocco uh, because you're not going to grow uh, what's being grown in Napa Valley and get the same quality of food out of it. So what I'm saying is we need to think out 20, 30 years, maybe more if you're talking about long-lived apple trees, if you're talking about semi-dwarf fruits like uh, peaches and nectarines and all of that, you can switch every 10, 15 years. But for some of these older lived things, like I'm going up to Bishop's Lodge tomorrow and there's some hundred year old apple trees there. I like being around old folks, they make me feel young, so that's why I hang out with old trees these days. This makes a difference. Yeah. What impact are you seeing in bee colonies and colonization Bee colonies. Oh boy, that is my favorite topic. Topic. I just talked at UNM in Albuquerque on this today. So um, the the goofy thing is that we know bees are declining, right? It was on Time Magazine, so we all believe Time Magazine, and we know that you know colony collapse is happening. What Time Magazine forgot to tell you is that honeybees are probably the least of it. We have enormous. Um, uh, declines in bumblebee populations and many other wild bees that are also hit both by climate change and neonicotinoid uh, 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 chemicals that farmers use. And we're also seeing dramatic declines in pollinators like monarchs because of um, herbicide um, uh, resistant corn, GMO corn being planted and then farmers spraying more herbicides that kill milkweeds than ever before. So we think about uh, a quarter of all the declines of monarchs in Mexico are due to American farmers killing milkweed. So it's not just honeybees that are in steep decline, and but these other groups. And even more than that, the where I have my office in Tucson, compared to a century ago, we have 41-day earlier flowering of many of the perennial shrubs than, than a century ago. So it's real easy to be out of sync between the flowers and the pollinators. It's like, what if, um, what if um, uh, you decided to meet someone for a date and they came three hours before you arrived at the restaurant and left two hours after they got there because they didn't think you were going to show up. I mean, that's kind of like what it's like if you're dating a pollinator these days and you're a flower, you know, you don't know which of you is going to be early and which of you is going to be late. And so there's there's a lot of problems due to this uh, asynchrony that's now been documented in hummingbirds and certain bees and other things. And so what do we do about that? Well, <clears throat> it isn't that we have to to um, you know, um, text message down to Mexico and say to the hummingbirds, don't show up uh, when you usually do. Show up three weeks earlier because um, you know the flowers are starting to bloom now, so that they can get the message to come up early. What we have to do is plant a wider range of plants with flowering times. So we're actually empirically designing wildflower mixes and hedgerow shrub mixes for a wider range of flowering times and a wider range of nectar sources so that we can keep pollinators in place whatever time they show up. So there's a whole chapter on um, this pollinator issue. I'm working almost day to day on this in southern Arizona where we've declared the little town I live in, Patagonia, Arizona, the pollinator capital of North America. Now I bet that's something a thousand other towns are vying for. You know, and there's, People don't, you know, they'd rather be that than the bowling capital of North America or something. But the point is that we have pride that we're doing all this restoration for pollinators in our town and that it's uh, really become something that hundreds of citizen scientists are involved in across the country, putting in miles and miles of hedgerows and wildflower plantings for pollinators to protect them from, or buffer them from climate change. Over here. What are you finding in? colleges and universities, not just in the southwest, but across the country, and talking about 
innovations and changes for young people yeah. going back into farming? They've come to study agriculture and yeah. going back. What are you finding? Well, I, um, I hang around universities in part, uh, though I'm a high school dropout and I can't believe I'm still around you know, any kind of educational institution because I'm allergic to them. But I'm finding that the kids are on fire about these issues, that you know, it's not just that thousands of kids have gone to jail with Bill McKibben and the, the 350 movement. Bill McKibben wrote the introduction to this book while in jail for doing conscious, conscientious objection about uh, climate change. But um, a lot of them don't want to be bystanders of the food system. They want to be co-designers of the food system. That may not mean that they think of themselves as, as lifetime farmers, but they want to work part-time on farms or want to volunteer time for their CSA share, or they want to help manage a farmer's market or be part of the friends of the farmer's market group or help with the community food kitchen. There's so many different roles that kids now see in the food system that can help it be not only more climate friendly, but just and equitable and resilient. And so I think as I go from campus to campus, I see faculty members that used to real, really do ivory tower stuff being pulled down from the ivory tower by the kids who say, do something practical for our community. If your theory is good enough, help make it work in our community. Don't just do paper studies, apply it here. And the students I see everywhere, from St. John's to UNM to New Mexico State, are just ready to jump into this dance and adapt. There's one kid uh, that Deja and I knew flag, in Flagstaff, I was thinking about this today as they were talking about the, the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. He said, this climate change issue for us is what civil rights was like for your generation. It is a life and death thing of whether people can live with dignity or not because the people most marginalized by climate change already are the poor. We've had food riots in 32 countries, all that Arab Spring stuff. If you look at the underlying drivers of, of what caused those first riots, in half of them it was the inequity in the food system and the poor not even being able to, to buy food, the price of grain quadrupling in one year, things like that. So kids are on fire about this and they're leading us and we're being dragged along, and in my case, it's being dragged along happily. Yes? Could you be more specific about the infrastructure changes that are needed? Yeah, infrastructure changes is a great way to say it, because when I say we can't distribute food like we have in the past, it's because that other four-fifths of our carbon footprint isn't what happens on the farm, but what we truck into farms and what we truck out of farms. And a quarter of the waste is much energy wasted from the time we bring grocery stores in our door to the time they get dumped in the garbage can or fed to the dog. It's the same as the energy use on farms. It's incredible how much food and energy is wasted in those last five days of a food's lifetime before it gets through our mouth. Okay. So there's some really interesting issues. If we're, you know, I've, I've been called, um, you know, uh, or last month I was called a warmest because I believe that the planet is, I, that really hurt my feelings. You know? And then I found out that the guy was an ice ageist, that he had actually been frozen in an ice flow in the Swiss Alps for four or five hundred years and just got out and it found out that his gelato melted and so he's mad at people so he picked on me. But, but there's, you know, there's people who, who think, oh, the infrastructure that now allows us to move food around 1,500 miles before it crosses our lips is always going to be that way. Our bridges, highway systems, railroad systems, are cracking, weathering, breaking down because of the severity of these uh, climate effects. You know, I mean, I was up in Vermont uh, a couple months ago and I saw all those weird signs along the side of the road. I mean, not that I should say, Vermont has weird signs on the side of the road compared to New Mexico. Limited visibility may be possible. I mean, that's the whole issue with climate change. Limited visibility is what's hurting us now. But up there they have those signs that say frost heaves, you know, for the first 
three times they saw him, I thought they were talking about Robert Frost. You know, but it's the roads that are, that kind of stuff is being aggravated by all this, these dramatic freezes and then droughts and all of that. Our infrastructure is really fragile and brittle, breaking down, and that's hundreds of billions of dollars of cost that we can attribute just to aggravated climate uh, change factors alone. So we can't think that in another 15 years, it's going to be cost efficient to, to move most food 1,500 miles. It may be for grains or some dry legumes. It's not going to be for beef. It's not going to be for green vegetables. Most of that's going to be grown in or near our cities, on vacant lots, on roofs, with gray water, with runoff water. And we have to redo our infrastructure to accommodate that. Yeah. To continue with the infrastructure question, this spring it was very cold. And so many of the farmers at the farmer's market just didn't have any fruit. We know some farmers, and they're peach farmers, but they just had no peaches yeah. this year. They didn't have any apricots. So yeah. how does those farmers, which are local, how do they, where do they go to try to do this experimentation, to try different varieties? Well, let me comment on that. That's exactly my position. This was going to be the year where two-thirds of our trees were mature, okay? And they all flowered, and I was really happy because they flowered in March, and then we had an April 10th killing freeze with all the flowers still on the plants. And I have some pomegranates and figs that I'm entering in the, the county fair, but most everything else is passing this year, and that happened all over the place. So one of the odd anomalies with, with climate change and fruit trees is that things like apricots are just dying to flower when we have one of those early heat spurts in the winter and inevitably we still have a later cold event. So more and more of these things are vulnerable. That's why we may want to go to later maturing varieties to escape this problem that we're having like what you're saying. What's happening not with fruit trees but to some extent with fruit trees, I'll get back to that in a second, but with vegetables, is my buddy Elliot Coleman getting everyone from Alaskans to folks in Maine to do high tunnels and hoop houses and stuff. I used to hate plastic houses, now I am one. I have this place where I have quick throughput of a lot of vegetables and native plants. I've just built a little nursery by a farm. And my goal is to get them in and out of that within um, three weeks, just quick throughput, put them out in the garden after the danger freezes over and start another batch. So that's one strategy that they're doing. There's two other, I think, more sensible strategy than covering the whole landscape in plastic. One is um, doing uh, what I called earlier stack functions of different layers of fruit trees or native trees like mesquite down where I live as nurse plants over more uh, heat and cold vulnerable vegetables and uh, vines and berries and things like that. The other thing that's happening in the French countryside is putting solar collectors about this high up or higher the tractors can go through. I mean, to, in other words, there might be a row of plants where these posts are of, of uh, dwarf trees or vines, grape vines or uh, vegetable beds, but but still enough uh, room for small equipment to go between the rows. And so the, the solar collectors are high. They allow the passage of small machinery. And the vegetables are spending 40% of their time in the shade, and their yields go up. Their heat stress goes down. Their disease levels go down. And so you're not only generating all the on-farm energy needs from this kind of uh, combination of solar energy production and uh, uh, heat buffering, but you're, but you're bringing in more returns. So there's a lot of different strategies just with shading happening uh, that I think are really effective in this climate. Yeah. What about scalability for a lot of these things you're talking about? A lot of these demographics. We have 2 billion more people by 2050. By 2035, we're going to increase or have our, our energy consumption going to increase 50%. Mm -hmm. um, by 2050, it's going to be too hot to grow any food in Africa. Um, 
is a matter of demographic. Well, Africa is not monolithic any more than the U.S. is. I mean, there's an incredible diversity of climates and cultures there, but I generally agree with your thing that scalability is the key issue that farmers raise when they look at this book, because they say, you're mostly talking about small and medium scale agriculture, aren't you, now, Ham? I say, well, 50,000 acres in the Gobi Desert, where it's hotter and drier than here, with 500 grape varieties and about 250 varieties of vegetables below sea level and 116 degrees ain't too bad for small-scale agriculture. 50,000 acres in one valley, okay? So this can be scaled up. And the, the issue that I think is a key one with the farmers that are in the Midwest with 2,000 acres reading this is I'm not saying that they should farm like me, like I said earlier, you know, don't farm like Dr. Chaos. Take the principles in here and adapt them to your scale. This isn't a formula. I don't believe in silver bullets. I don't believe in, in magic fixes. You know, where we have uh, uh, one of the Buffett kids down by Bisbee who says, I'm going to figure out how in Bisbee to teach farmers in Africa to grow food year round. Farmers in Africa are growing food year-round. I just had a visitor from Zimbabwe who's doing community seed banks in 50 villages. They have more diversity out in their, their fields on rain-fed agriculture than they probably ever had. So I think this is a very interesting point. When people say, how are you going to feed 9 billion? We don't have the carrying capacity to do that in some places with urbanization or land degradation. I say, Instead of talking about carrying capacity, why don't we talk about caring capacity? That right now in the United States, a third of our kids are either hungry or obese. They aren't getting the nutrients, uh, nutritionally dense foods in their diet now. We're wasting some of the best farmland in the world and not feeding our own population. We've imported more food to the United States the last three years than we've exported to other countries. And we have the farmland and the water that most countries envy. And I think turning it around and say, how do we increase carrying, carrying capacity so that we care for the poorest of the poor, we care for the land, is the primary step that we need to take to even fathom getting to nine billion. We're not even doing a good job with six billion because we waste <laughs> half the food that we produce in the American agricultural system every day. What if that other half were available either to people directly or to backyard poultry or, or livestock rather than seeing it go in landfills to generate more methane? So I think we have to really say, okay, we, uh, we know nine billion is an incredible challenge, not only for food production, but for water management. We're gonna suck most of our reservoirs dry. How do we, make sure that what we do have is going to really feed people so that our kids and elders uh, aren't hungry. Hey, Gary, uh, could you maybe say a little more about uh, what you mentioned in your interview this morning about the composting project in the San Francisco Bay Area? Oh, yeah. What, a couple of things. What really made that happen? And are there any sort of stumbling blocks now? How do you see that as being yeah. functional? Yeah, this was and an interview with Mary Charlotte uh, this morning, and yes. I'm so grateful that you guys have her in the community. If you ever want to loan her out to us or clone her, we'd love to have her on radio in Southern Arizona. Yeah. Um, so I've been uh, in um, collaboration with the Marin Carbon Project and the West Marin Composting Project, and they're finding some remarkable things. I mean, in Arizona, even to get some farmers or vineyard uh, keepers to put compost out on their land, it's like, oh, I could never do that. They're doing it on rangeland in Marin County and doing controlled experiments, taking uh, uh, wood shavings waste from dairies. They have all those cowgirl creamery dairies and other things there, so they have all this uh, bedding material mixing that with green waste from San Francisco in a matter of uh, uh, um, three to four months. They're getting terrific compost, but then they do 
like it's like a microbrewery of compost. Like if you want oyster shells in your compost because you have this kind of soil, we'll mix it that way for you. They have like six different designer composts for what kind of soil type they have there. And th here's a remarkable thing. It's doubling water holding capacity in their soil, doubling forage capacity, and increasing the beef production off the same amount of land. Uh, that we can increase the soil moisture holding capacity in most soils in the desert five to six fold by adding compost. There's a chapter in here on Ken Singh, the compost king of Arizona who got caliche, um, hard caliche soil in the, uh, off the Phoenix uh, uh, superhighway, um, buried the whole land in compost four to six feet deep and after eight years has 35 foot tall olive trees and fruit trees just by increasing the moisture holding capacity of that soil, which also reduces the heat loads and all of that and is growing multi tier things. In Arizona, 12 miles away from where I live in Nogales, we have the most methane rich landfill in the United States for two reasons. One is that 60% of the winter, com uh, winter vegetables that we eat across the whole country come through Nogales. It's the largest inland port of entry for food in the country. 15% of that, as soon as it hits Nogales, is stripped or they find that it's spoiled. And we're actually subsidizing that to be dumped in the landfill where it uh, creates methane. So I've just written a project for the EPA Border 2020 project to keep all of that green waste for, that essentially all of us who eat in the winter, eat salads and stuff in the winter, are, are helping generate. Take that out of the landfills, compost that with, with um, uh, wood chips from uh, thin forests or, or um, uh, thin mesquite patches that got too dense because of overgrazing. Well, we don't want to eliminate mesquite, but we want healthy mesquite populations put that carbon source from the wood chips together with the, the green waste and sell wholesale compost back to farmers, vineyard keepers, and uh, uh, orchard keepers within 60 miles of where it's produced. Right now, two-thirds of the cost of producing food in Arizona is from inputs that we import from out of state. If you go to any garden shop in Arizona, you find two things, uh, steer manure from Colorado and Wyoming and compost from Ohio. Why can't Arizona produce enough compost for its own food production? So we're trying to take something that's now an incredible waste, not only in terms of generating methane and filling up landfills, but it's <laughs> we're paying Mexican farm workers $5 a day to produce stuff of which then we waste 15 to 20 percent. And, and that's the justice issue. So we really want to make compost into a solution. Farmers don't want to be regulated in adapting to climate change. This is one way urban dwellers are separating out green waste as Portland and Berkeley and Seattle already do from their other stuff. We can help farmers adapt to climate change rather than regulating them, causing more fear of the climate mongers. Is most, is most of the green uh, vegetables that come through Nogales, is that grown with nitrogen fertilizer? Um, it varies from where it's from. Some is using the rich flood wash out of the Sierra Madre and it isn't fertilized much. Others is, is uh, fertilized with nitrogen so heavily that it's creating a dead zone in the Gulf of California. So it depends where it's coming from. Individual responsibility, I, I strongly believe, is fundamental for this to work. Uh, if you don't buy it, they won't import it. And it's very difficult locally to, you know, create that incentive to buy from local farmers, get up early, go to farmers market. What, what I what recommend? Get up early with me tomorrow and see me at the farmer's market. I'm going to have a soil aerobics class before the farmer's market. At the, it's like a Jane Fonda's dance aerobics workout, but we're going to do it with pitchforks to make contacts. No, that's, 
No, I mean, I, I think I think it has to go viral, that, that individuals matter, but you need a community of support to make change, okay? So, so we need individual ethics and will with the innovations that, that spark interest in this in the community, and I, I really want to honor uh, my green fire guy, where'd he go? Oh, there you are, for, for having such a great forum in this community about the yeah. issues and environmental issues. But the point is that that it takes some individual innovators and and um, change makers to get people excited about these issues. But then you need a lot of reinforcement. It has to become a community ethic. We can't save pollinators with one farm. You know, we need to have a whole food shed where pollinators are safe. We, it's the saddest thing for me is to find a great innovator who's doing all the right things on his or her farm and none of their neighbors are adopting it. That's the kind of thing that we need to switch. Yeah? The organization, the American Seed Search? Native, Native Seed Search, Native yeah. Seed Search. Are they still in operation? And if they are, are how are they operating with this climate uncertainty program? Oh, boy, oh, boy. So um, I was one of the founders. I live right above the farm, and that's where I have my orchard. So. When I die, they're just going to roll me downhill and cop those things. Okay. <laughs> um, but but um, they're evaluating their whole collection now for days to maturity, earliness, uh, heat stress, and all of that. And they're planning to do that at multiple sites, not just the site in Patagonia, because we're at 4,000 feet there and don't get the kind of heat stress that Tucson and, and Phoenix already get. In fact, um, you know, uh, I, I don't want to apologize or make excuses for Sheriff Arpaio in Maricopa County, but I think he's a victim of heat stress. It's a fair, of, a fair number of brain cells and ethical conduits in his body. But the point is that Native Seed Search is doing a whole climate change agenda for evaluating all those seeds, immigrant, indigenous seeds, and finding uh, a, a way to talk about those adaptations because that's what's hidden from you when you just see the seeds. Yes, over here. Uh, in Europe, there is a lot of interest in roof gardens. Do you see any place for this year in the land of flat roofs? Roof, roof. Yes, thank you, Monica. Uh, and by the way, if you don't know Los Aves in Nuevo Mexico, my favorite book of the year by, by our author here. Um, so um, what I want to say is that um, roof gardens are catching on all over the place. I know uh, some folks doing it in... in uh, uh, Brooklyn, in Seattle, in um, Chicago, Rick Bayless uh, of La Frontera Grill has roof gardens on it. Also vertical walls, I'm helping Chef Chris Bianco, who used to be around the corner that way, uh, in the uh, 90s um, at, uh, what was that restaurant he worked at? I, know, I can't remember anything. Anyway, the point is that uh, vertical walls for herb gardens are also popular, and window farms where um, 1,200 people around the world are collaborating on doing stairwell in uh, multi-story apartment building, um, vertical gardens of hydroponics where, where they're using solar pumps, recycled materials to grow herbs and vegetables in vertical spaces. So there's a lot of innovation on how urban food production is being done. Kavir <coughs> Coalition has always said, we're not going to get anywhere unless we dissolve the urban-rural divide and see all of us as eaters and food producers, and the farm bill is not just for farmers, it's for all of us. So I think this rooftop gardening stuff is really, really exciting. Yes, back here. Yeah. So uh, where was oh, that? I'm sorry, this lady in stripes first. Yeah, sure. Biodynamic compost, and I just wanted to mention that when possible, in a local context, it's a lot um, better to use cow manure once able because it holds so much more moisture than horse. 